Hello and welcome to this online class on the Irish Famine or sometimes referred to as the Great Irish Famine For the purposes of this topic I have split the um, lectures into two so we'll look first and foremost at the causes of the Irish Famine and then in a subsequent YouTube lecture we will focus on the consequences of the Irish Famine and in that second class we will also examine the way that historians have viewed the, the Irish Famine um, especially the, the causes of it so there will be a discussion of historiography this entire um, topic will be assessed it's worth five percent of your overall mark and it will be assessed via um, a forum post that you will make more information on that will be given to you via email and my city. So first of all, um, I would like to say before we start this topic is that you go to my city and you click on the section in the Irish um, famine category where it says um, um, sources and you click on these Irish famine sources. You're going to need some of these sources as we run through, um, as we run through these slides. So let's, um, yeah, let's begin with what is uh, incredibly um, tragic topic, an emotional topic in some respects, um, but a really interesting um, topic and it's a topic that we can examine with um, events that happen in the present day and with famines that have happened in, in, in recent times as well. So let's begin with the, the basics, right, what was, what was the famine? And um, I guess the best place to start is with the first source that you have access to. Um, this um, source is from um, a guy called William Trench, um, who was a land agent in Kings County, um, which is now County of Valley in Ireland. And his crop in 1846 was affected by a potato blight. And this potato blight, this infestation, had spread from North America to Europe, across Europe, um, places like Germany and Belgium, France, and it made its way to Britain, but especially to Ireland where um, potato production was higher than any other part of the, the UK. And the reliance upon potatoes was, was, was greater here. And we'll come back to this point um, in due course. But this guy, William Trench, was completely taken aback, shocked by what he um, stumbled across in 1846 when he viewed his crop. And he says that he could basically bear the smell, the smell of this infestation within the potato. He said it was so rank um, that the, the crop, which looked okay, you know, from um, the outside, um, but the smell gave him this idea that something was wrong with the potato um, crop. And when you cut into the potato, um, you could see decay. You could see um, the black potato blight um, rotting the potatoes. And what had been um, a source of um, income and a source of obviously um, sustenance for Irish people all of a sudden was, was disappearing or disappearing fast, melting away as Trench suggests. And this is in um, 1846. I'm going to take you through a number of the years from 1845, uh, really through at the end of the period, um, which is really the 1850s. The famine does not last one year. The blight of the potato crop does not just last for one year. So, the immediate cause or the kind of natural cause, if you like, of the Irish famine was this um, this potato blight, this um, disease um, that was um, um, so kind of devastating to the Irish potato crop. And this might therefore suggest that nobody is to blame for the famine because you know this 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 was an act of nature, this this um, disease. However, when one million people die, approximately, and one million are forced to leave, maybe even more than that have to leave if we kind of extend our time frame beyond the 1850s, then that might suggest that why was there um, a situation allowed to occur that people could um, die in this, in this magnitude? Yes, food might disappear, yes, the, the staple crop might disappear, but surely there were methods and ways of ensuring that people did not die just because potato crops um, had failed across um, Ireland. Now the impact of the famine, as I said, was it was devastating, and you can see this in source two with the um, population um, graph. 
Ireland did have a fairly large population, and you can see this on the, the little drawn on the left hand side here of the, the, the slide in the bottom left hand side. When Ireland became part of Britain in 1801, right from the, the, the Act of Union, the population then was roughly 5 million. By the time we get to the 1840s, it has increased to um, approximately 8 million. This is a, a real major increase in the um, size of the, 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 the population. Now, the reason for this increase is partly to do with the potato, because it was a really useful crop. It helped people um, you know, live in a fairly basic way but it gave people the nutrients that they required to, to kind of live um, a decent standard of, um, maybe not a decent standard of living, but a decent standard of health. And Irish men um, and women were, you know, above average in terms of um, height and, and weight across um, Europe. So the potato did provide some benefits, right, if they were supplemented with a few other little um, foodstuffs to kind of ensure um, vitamins were, um, were, were kind of given that were required. And there was, um, as I said, this kind of boost in the, the population. Now, that did worry some people within Ireland, it worried some people within Britain, because remember, Ireland is part of Britain at this point. Um, if this population increase was to continue, um, what might happen to um, pressure on land and food within Ireland? The population of Ireland primarily worked on the land and they would often um, feed themselves, as this little diagram here again shows, on small plots where potatoes could be easily, fairly easily produced in a productive, um, productive manner. The land was not great that Irish peasant farmers had to work with. They basically had been given the worst land that was left over. The poorest of the poor usually get the worst land. The better land was left for um, more wealthy farmers and landowners who might um, farm cattle or grain or wheat. So the potato crop was useful because it could be grown in poor conditions in small plots of land and enough potatoes could be grown um, in the kind of, over the kind of summer period that uh, the harvest would take place in, in, in early autumn and then potatoes would really be expected to last for the majority of, of the year because they could be stored um, fairly well. And that was um, that was the way that things the, the way that things worked. But it meant that there was a real poverty problem within in Ireland. You know, a large part of the population were, were poor because this was their their way of their way of life. And there was, as I've mentioned in the top left hand corner, there was no industrial revolution really within Ireland. Dublin is the only major city. Um, Belfast is starting to grow in the north of the, the country, but Dublin is really the only major city. And even Dublin is more of a a university town and a kind of financial area rather than an industrial um, area. Part of the reason as to why there's no industrial revolution is because the population are on the land and they remain on the land because they can remain on the land. They don't have to, they're not being kicked off the land to go and find um, work in other parts of the country. And the reason they're not kicked off the land is because landlords, I'm going to click to another little slide, um, another little um, diagram. Not a particularly good diagram, but landlords, sometimes absentee landlords who are living back in Britain, they would own land and they might control the bits of the land that they want, right? So in the kind of within the green circle. But then within the circle you've then got land that they would sell on to other farmers, to smaller farmers. And these smaller farmers might sell on the land again to peasants. So it's landlord gets rent from small farmers, small farmers get rent from peasants. And because of this um, system, landlords were doing quite well, smaller farmers were doing okay, peasants were getting enough um, food to survive through the potato crop. There was no real desire to change this system, especially if it was an absentee landlord who didn't really care what was going on within um, his estate in Ireland. If everybody was getting on and surviving and sometimes making decent money, then why innovate? Why think about um, larger scale farming? If the majority of the population are living on the land and they can survive in this way, then there's no need for them to migrate looking for jobs, as I mentioned in other parts of um, Ireland. The reality was, this is um, the, the nature, I guess, of, 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 of potato farming, um, was that you didn't really have to do that much. Once you'd kind of planted your crop and taken care of it and then picked it, the rest of the year you could be fairly limited in um, the labour that you had to engage in. Now, if there was a larger scale agricultural system, i.e. not the kind of small 
parcels of land that we see here, then you can actually have less people in rural areas. If let's say one landlord decided that he was going to stop just producing potatoes and move to wheat production or another type of um, crop, then instead of these um, peasant farmers not really working for large parts of the year because they've got their food, right, they've got what they need, um, they would have to work throughout the majority of the year. Um, and you wouldn't need then as many farmers, right, because um, less people, maybe two-fifths of the rural population could do the work. At the moment, you've got this uh, much larger population and rural areas is probably needed. So, how do you get out of that problem, that predicament, is something I'll touch on um, in a second. Um, okay, I just want to very quickly go back to one thing uh, that I mentioned. Um, or I didn't mention, sorry, which is a quote from the famous British historian A.G.P. Taylor, where he says, all Ireland was a belson. So when the famine does um, hit, when it's reported in the press, when news comes back to, to Britain, um, people do start to kind of um, hear about the, the kind of uh, problems that are going on in the, the hunger. And when A.G.P. Taylor, writing in the post-World War II period, refers to the Ireland of the famine era as being like a belson, this meant something to British people in the post-war period because the Bergen Belsen and concentration camp had been liberated by the British. There had been pictures and video footage of the liberation of Belsen and these images of the liberation of Belsen from the Nazis show a starving population, people dying of disease, people dying of hunger, Jews mostly uh, dying of these, um, of these things. And therefore people in Britain could visualise what that was like post-World War II. So it's a useful some people would say it's, it's not a fair um, comparison, but it's a useful comparison to maybe get a sense of just how bad things were um, during the, the famine years. Now, let's jump to um, source M3 um, and touch on the, the kind of land problem that I mentioned. You can read this source from Robert Torrens um, in your own time, but the point that Torrens is making in 1838, right, so this predates the famine by um, a few years, Torrens is basically of the view that the, the situation in Ireland needs resolving. All of this small land um, in the hands of um, small peasants working land which was you know, not the most productive other than potatoes. He believed that this, this kind of had to change. But how do you change it without being cruel to those who live on it? You can't just tough people off the land. You can't just say uh, landlords will now um, take greater control of their... their, their um, their territory, their land, and will grow crops that um, are not potatoes. Because if you do that, what do you do with these people who rely upon that crop, who rely upon that very tiny parcel of land that they have? Well, the view here was, um, according to Torrens, um, something that I mentioned, which was maybe you have to, in a humane way, um, replace the population. And um, he, he uses the, the word provide adequate provision for maintaining the part of the population that you request um, move on and leave the land so that Ireland can start to progress as a country, can start to become more wealthy, rather than being stuck in this kind of dilemma of um, basically just being a completely agricultural society. So Torres does um, make reference to um, the problem. This um, source from Torres was known as the plan of an association in aid of the Irish poor law. 1838 is the year that the Irish Poor Law is, um, is put into, into law, um, four years after the, the British uh, Poor Law. And really what the government recommends, apart from reform of land, um, they, you know, which, which, which doesn't happen, um, so Torrens suggestions are, are, are not taken on board, um, there's a little bit of a desire to help people immigrate because that would relieve pressure on the population. And the Poor Law is in place really just to make sure that those who do suffer have somewhere to go and obviously it's the workhouse system that's put in place and there are roughly um, 130 parishes in Ireland and these 130 parishes combined can cater for 100,000 workhouse inmates. So there was a view that things could be dealt with under the current situation if problems um, emerge. So the question is, um, was there a major um, concern about famine, well we kind of get the sense that there are some concerns about the, the way that the land is used. Was famine inevitable? The, probably one of the most renowned historians on this topic, Cormac O'Grada. O'Grada says famine was not inevitable. He says the pre-famine economy had many problems, injustices, but it did not contain the seeds 
of its own um, inevitable, inevitable destruction um, by by famine. He believed that um, you know the, the the Irish economy or the Irish rural economy anyway was was doing okay, was doing okay. So basically, the question is, what what happens? What um, what happens once once this um, potato blight starts to take um, hold? Um, there is another source here, but I'm going to come back to this um, source at the end, the bottom left hand corner source, um, which tells us about the size of land holding, land holdings in Ireland. Um, so here we get this potato blight, and the question really is, how do we go from this natural disaster to the deaths of men, women and children, at least one million of which are linked in some way to the failure of this potato crop. And not only how does this happen, how does it happen within um, Britain? Ireland is part of Britain, it's one of the wealthiest states in the world at this point, if not the wealthiest. How can such a prolonged and devastating crisis take hold? Why was there not enough interaction by the British government to save um, some of these these lives? So the answer to that question, right, or starting off point is, perhaps the reason as to why a million Irish people die is because of British government policy. It's not necessarily British desire to see people die, but British government policies. One main policy is an economic policy we're going to refer to called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire economics, i.e. do not intervene in the economy, leave it to market forces, is going to be a factor in pushing up the death rates in, in Ireland, as we will see. You've also got some negative attitudes towards Irish people, so there's an element of racism that had always existed. If you even go back to kind of um, the early modern period in Ireland, Elizabethan Ireland, for example, there was um, a view of the British Remember, Britain had been involved in Ireland since the 12th century. Um, there was a view that the Irish were just racially inferior. And if you add to that one other element, which we might refer to as religious providentialism, there was a sense that the Irish, partly because they were Catholics, had brought this upon themselves. And this was God's work, kind of cleansing this nation of a surplus population. That sounds obviously ludicrous to us, but at the time, um, it kind of tied in with some of the economic attitudes that existed alongside religious attitudes uh, during the, um, the mid 19th century. So here we can see some statistics. 1844, pre-famine there are 15 million tonnes of potatoes. The first year of the famine, that's the autumn of 1845, there's a 5 million drop. So there's a, a sign here that something's not quite right. 10 million tonnes uh, rather than 15 million tonnes. That's why the famine really begins once we get into 1846, once people don't have the same amount of potatoes to last them for as long as they had. So the crisis really um, begins um, in um, late 1845 and 1846. The government at this point is led by Robert Peel, who's a Tory. And Peel gets you know, a, a decent um, kind of, um, or gives it a decent kind of go at trying to improve things and historians are a bit more sympathetic to Peel and his government than they will be the next government of um, Lord John Russell who's a Whig. Because Peel does intervene, right, and these interventions are in the form of the workhouses, which we, we know are in place because of the 1838 Act and most of these are, are in place and ready to go by 1845. Um, also, a public works programme is set up, and the public works programme will pay um, guys, men mostly, who would have traditionally been you know, picking um, potato crop. They are now being given a chance to take part in public works to produce roads and walls and um, improve some of the infrastructure within Ireland. Don't get me wrong, this is back-breaking work, which is not always the thing you want to do when you are suffering from malnutrition. Um, but they would get a small amount of money, and with that small amount of money that they would get paid, they could use it to buy food. And here is an example of a government sale of Indian corn in Cork, in the southern part of Ireland. And what we um, what we see here is a, a, a really good example of intervention. So the British government buy cheap Indian corn from the United States, it's shipped to Ireland, 
the money made from the public work scheme allows people to buy um, this this corn. Don't get me wrong, the corn and what you could do with it was, was fairly limited and uh, Irish people um, were not particularly keen on it, but it was a form of food. It wasn't maybe as nutritious as the potato, but it was a form of food that people believe would help the Irish people get through the year or so until the next potato crop emerged. Obviously Peel was unaware that the next potato crop um, would be problematic um, as well. So things start off with at least a suggestion that there is a, an attempt by the British government to assist the Irish people. But then in 1846, so in the autumn of 1846, the next potato crop suffers even more. This is the potato crop that um, Robert, um, sorry, the William French um, referred to in the, the first source. Complete collapse, only 3 million tonnes of potatoes are, are produced. The previous measures of the Peel government are clearly not going to be enough to sustain um, the population um, at this point. So we are now seeing examples of hunger, disease and death um, across Ireland. And newspapers do start to report what's going on and letters are written, that are published in newspapers and letters are written to politicians in an attempt to try and um, you know, en encourage or convince the British population to um, do a bit, a bit more or for the British government um, to do um, a bit more. Um, there's a source, source for um, that you can again read um, in detail in your own time. It is from um, a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Cummins who um, was an acquaintance of the uh, Duke of Wellington and he writes this letter to the Duke of Wellington and the Duke of Wellington is um, being asked to raise awareness more than anything else. And in this, um, in this letter, Cummins basically is trying to provide a kind of an emotional response to the scenes of disease that he sees in a place on the south called Skibbereen. Um, and he uses kind of colourful language in the letter to get his point across and he refers to the scenes of frightful hunger or he refers to the wretched hamlet, the ghastly skeletons and the demonic yells of the sick. So he's really painting a, a graphic picture of what life is like. He um, is also trying to um, get a point across. Is he exaggerating? Well, you, you could argue he's doing that to try and um, gain sympathy and intervention, but he might also just be genuinely disturbed by what he's witnessed in his travels around this part of Ireland. So um, a really kind of useful indication of, of not only what is going on, but what attitudes did exist for those who witnessed um, the real kind of horrors of, of the famine. This is 24th of December 1846, so this is after the second crop has completely failed. Now, some of the attempts to um, entice sympathy and support from British can be seen um, with the famous Queen's letter. She writes a letter to Archbishop of Canterbury. It's then published in the Times newspaper. And when it's published in the newspaper, the Queen is basically saying to the British people, um, you know, I would, I would quite like it if you could, uh, this is Queen Victoria, I should say, I would quite like it if you could help, you know, donate money. This money can then go to the Irish. And it does, right, £170,000 um, worth is, is raised. And this, again, is showing that maybe the British do regard Ireland as part of the country and therefore um, the Irish deserve um, support. And this can be seen also in these images of the period. These are images that kind of reflect attitudes in 1846 and early 1847. Here's a woman with a young child begging at Clonakilty. And the way that this woman is depicted is one which I, can, I kind of guess evokes sympathy. Um, and she obviously is clearly um, struggling um, due to the famine and maybe even has a sick um, child in her arms. That is an attempt to obviously show that these, are, these Irish uh, women are, are mothers and need um, assistance. Um, this image is a little bit blurred, but the point really being made here is this is John Bull talking to a, an Irish potato farmer with his uh, kids, all looking rather distraught. And what John Bull is giving the man is a, is a basket of, of bread. And what the caption at the bottom says is, Union is strength. This again gives the impression that the British are out there to um, help and assist their, their, their Irish brothers and sisters. Because Ireland now was part of, of the Union. So this is a kind of pro-Irish um, news story or news cartoon. And then this um, final image also appeared in newspapers. 
uh, refers to what happened in early 1847, which was the establishment of food kitchens. Here you've kind of got your wealthy um, Irish um, slash English landowners and merchants, right? So the wealthier aspects of the country in Dublin coming to the grand opening of the first food kitchen um, or soup kitchen. And there was um, a real sense that this was the British again helping. Here's a great idea. You know, give, give people what they what they need, i.e. food, and it can be um, something that keeps them going until, fingers crossed, hopefully the 1847 um, potato crop is, is back to its uh, normal capacity. So you could say that initially things were, were, were not great, obviously people were, were dying during this period, but at least there was a sense that there was assistance, help, and a kind of um, desire to um, show some type of humanity. So that final image, as I say, just shows the uh, um, um, Soup Kitchen Act, which was passed in um, 1847, start of 1847, and was incredibly successful. Right? It fed 3 million people daily. That's remarkable, right? 3 million people daily. Now, at the end of 1846, we have a new government, and this new government are a Whig government. They are partly brought to power because of the issue of the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws, which had been really the, the scorn of the working class because it led to inflated food prices, and um, they were eventually. Um, removed, they were removed by the Whig government. They might, my argument would be this was beneficial to the working class, but the reason why the Whigs wanted this passed, or certain elements of the Whig government wanted this law passed, was because they felt that it restricted free trade. And it was a form of government intervention in the economy. And the government should not intervene in the economy. The kind of ideological doctrine of free trade or laissez faire was zero government intervention. Now, this was arguably the last example of um, assistance because the Whig government believed that Indian corn could no longer be sold at such a low price because that was an example of government interference so Indian corn could still be imported but it'd have to be sold at a market price Irish grain exports still continued to leave Ireland as did cattle the public works were closed because they were deemed to be costing too much money and the soup kitchens were ended by the summer of 1847 now, all of these measures taken together are going to lead to a catastrophe. When we look at other measures that are taken later on, the catastrophe is exacerbated further. Historians have been very critical of the Whig government of Lord John Russell, the Chancellor. So Russell was the Prime Minister. The Chancellor was Charles Wood. And there's another individual who is also kind of um, an ally of Wood, a guy called Charles Trevelyan, whose job it was to really kind of oversee um, the Irish famine. Trevelyan also has is, 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 is been given great kind of criticism for his involvement in the, the Irish famine. So, are the Irish people now being left to their own devices? Well, the Whig government was saying no because they do replace the famine aid with the Poor Law Extension Act. The Poor Law Extension Act was not, was not great, it just meant that the Irish taxpayer was now expected to um, look after and care for those affected by the famine, i.e. they would fund the workhouses or they would have to provide outdoor relief for people living on their estates but there's a problem with that because if people living on Irish um, estates, or these potato um, farmers, they've not got any crop to sell, they've not got any crop to give even as rent so rents are not coming away of the landlords, the landlords are actually losing money some landlords were good landlords and they tried to feed their, 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 their um, tenant farmers and peasants, others didn't care and when a new law was implemented called the Gregory Clause of the Poor Law Extension Act, it meant that tenants who did require some relief, they had to give up their land, they had to give up their little patch of land. Now the reason for this was one, to again try and push people towards the workhouses, there's a problem there, 100,000 capacity it was roughly what we had in um, 1845, by 1849 there are 900,000 people in the workhouses with that comes many problems. People start to pick up diseases as they move around the country. One of the diseases that people pick up is typhus. Typhus is spread. It's known sometimes as the fever. As typhus spreads, um, it spreads in workhouses like wildfire um, and people will start to die. And a lot of the deaths that we see during Irish famine, the million or so deaths, are not necessarily always from starvation. Uh, people are you know, just dying purely because they've got no food. Some diseases are linked to malnutrition, but others are linked to diseases like typhus and dysentery um, because of a lack of cleanliness. People don't change their clothes, people wash less as they are on the move throughout the country. 
um, to try and get access to, to um, poor, um, the poor law workhouse. Remember Ireland as a rural country um, is pretty sparse in terms of um, links and roads and ways that you can get from one part of the country to the other. So if you live in a really remote area, you may have to walk for days before you get to the closest um, workhouse. Um, I should say that the Gregory Clause therefore um, put pressure on um, the workhouse system because a landlord could now basically say, look, if I'm not getting any rent and this person who works the land, this, this peasant, wants poor relief, that's fine, but they're going to have to give up the land. If they don't give up the land, we're just going to evict them. The British government gave landlords the opportunity to evict um, people that could not um, pay their rent. So you know, now you've got this homeless population dying on the roadside, dying on the way to the workhouse, dying in the workhouse. You have got um, good news in some respects for the, um, the, the those who really believe that the Irish um, um, rural kind of farming system needed completely reassessed because here was the opportunity to, as Robert Torrance had said, to get rid of some of the people living on the land. And that little graph that I mentioned at the start, right, you can go back to um, um, the first kind of slide. Um, if you look at that little um, bar chart, you'll see that the amount of um, small holdings decreases and larger estates increase. And that's because of evictions and it's because um, there was an opportunity now to um, you know, get rid of all of these small plots of, of potato producing um, land. Um, so you have evictions. And evictions, as I said, are going to have drastic consequences because people are now going to find themselves um, with even less means of security. Um, 1847, how would the potato crop um, perform it on this year? It's low again, it's 2 million. So it just adds to the problems and the pressure. The poor relief um, was becoming a necessity for most of, 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 kind of Irish potato farmers, especially in the west of the country. Uh, the poorest parts of the country where there was really um, no other crops um, growing. Landlords um, were now paying rates for the poor, were receiving no rent from these um, these peasant farmers, these smallholders, so it made sense for them to evict them. And one of the kind of images that you see is people being evicted, if they didn't leave, their roofs would be burned, their thatch roof on their cottage would be burned, and they would have no choice but to flee. If you ever get a chance to watch the slightly kind of dramatic movie about the Irish famine called Black 47 um, you see examples of these evictions. So there's a couple of scenes early on, maybe in the first half an hour of the movie, which are really good, which I think show quite well what life was like during um, famine, um, famine here at Ireland. Um, so by 1849 we've now got 900,000 in the workhouses and um, the, the whole nature of the Irish um, rural land system is beginning to, to change. Therefore, um, you could argue that the British government has, especially since the Whig government has come into power, they have allowed um, the Irish people to be kind of left to their own devices. They have allowed for um, people to basically be forced from their land and into, um, into the poor houses or the workhouses. So how do we summarise all of this? Well, attitudes in Britain have definitely changed in the period from 1846 to the time we get to 1849. The positive views that we saw in some of those images and newspapers and letters and so on start to disappear. Now that might be what we sometimes call charity fatigue. Here people get bored of hearing depressing stories, bored of giving money um, and they switch off from it. And you've got this laissez-faire ideology and as I said earlier on you've got racism towards the Irish. And the five years that the British government um, had had to kind of deal with the Irish um, famine they spent 8.3 million um, pounds um, in relief. Now this 8.3 million pounds therefore led to accusations that the British had kind of left the Irish um, to, to, to basically die. Um, in 1847, um, in the House of Commons, um, a Tory, um, Lord George Bentick, um, he accused the, the Whig government of purchasing free trade with the lives of the Irish people, leaving the people to take care of themselves when providence has swept the food from the face um, of the earth. So you've got some sim sympathetic politicians criticising this, this ideology. Um, Lord Salisbury, you know, 20 years after the famine, said something similar. He says the doctrines of laissez-faire political economy had been worshipped by the Whigs as some sort of fetish. And this, um, again, put ideology before um, humans. The people who were really 
at the sharp end of this um, criticism are Charles Trevelyan, who I mentioned, um, but also um, Lord John Russell's um, government. Um, in fact, some historians have even said that Ireland was abandoned um, to Trevelyan's operation of natural causes system and laissez-faire, and the historian Comet Ograda, who I mentioned, um, blames others in the government. One individual called Nasa Senior, who was responsible for the 1834 poor law amendment within Britain, he also gets um, criticised because these were individuals who believed that Irish men and women were responsible for their own behaviours and there was this view that they were lazy farmers, that all they wanted to do was sit about, possibly drink, um, have children, hence why the population expands um, in this uh, fairly short period of time. So there's a real sense that the Irish have brought this upon them themselves and the only way they will learn is if they learn the hard way and they learn the hard way means that they're going to have to um, accept their fate and um, that seems incredibly, um, incredibly cruel. To go back to the money, right, this 8.3 million spent, um, to kind of give you an idea of how this um, how this works out. Um, and I should say that the other individual who might not always get um, a, a kind of uh, criticised in the way that Trevelyan does is the Chancellor of the Ex Exchequer, Charles Wood. There's a podcast that you can listen to, it's on my site right at the very end. It's a podcast where historians debate the Irish famine, it's one of these in our time episodes that you've already listened to and um, Cormac Ograda, the man that I just mentioned, is on this uh, podcast and um, Ograda actually says, he says Charles Wood has kind of been ignored by some historians but he was ideological in his love of laissez-faire as Trevelyan was or other politicians of this um, era. Um, I just want to give you some statistics here. Um, in uh, the, the period of the famine there were loans that were given to, to Ireland to try and, you know, make sure that um, food could be found um, and these loans might buy for example Indian corn um, so in 1846-47 4 million was lo loaned in 1847-1848 that was down to roughly 2 million um, uh, but these loans were, were almost pretty much gone by the time we get to 1848 um, you know in 1847-1848 are the worst years of the famine um, treasury grants from central government to the Irish um, also sh um, sharp fail um, during this period and are pretty much non-existent by the time we get to 1849. In total, right, we can roughly estimate 8.3 million spent in relief. If we go back a decade, millions of pounds were spent um, in ensuring that British slaveholders were compensated for their um, loss of, of slaves. Their loss of slaves, right? We'll come to that story. Um, I guess, um, again, and you've already kind of looked at the the, the issue of, of, of slavery, but we haven't really talked about the abolition, not just of the slave trade, but the abolition of slavery, which happens in the um, 1830s in Britain. Um, and then, not long after, in the early 1850s, Britain goes to war, complicated war, right, known as the Crimean War that you might have heard of, right, we don't have to get into the ins and outs of it, but the British government spending on the army and the navy over a four or five year period, you know, this is 1854 onwards, right? So the famine still goes on in the early 1850s. Um, the British government spent 160 million on the army and the navy. This is the same chancellor, chancellor of the exchequer, or the same kind of ideology, the laissez-faire ideology, that suggests that you can't give money in to help the, the Irish. So you can see why in Ireland at this point, and then in more recent times with the historiography, um, really from the 1980s onwards, you can see why there's some resentment that people like Wood and Trevelyan and Russell had not done enough, in fact, they had done intentionally not enough so that maybe the problems of um, what was going on with an island population increase and um, an outdated land system could be um, addressed. I'm going to finish with um, Charles Trevelyan, right? Um, sources 5 and sources 6 within your um, source booklet um, both kind of refer to um, this idea that the British have not done enough. Um, and source 6 is actually an extract from a secondary source, right? It's from a historian, Suzanne Forbes, who gives a kind of list of reasons as to why you could make a case for um, this view that the British were involved in a policy of extermination, right? If you go back to what A.G.P. Taylor says, Delson 
um, was obviously a product of an attempted genocide. Well, if you take that and you transfer it to Ireland, some Irish people call the, the Great Irish Famine or the Great Hunger, they call it genocide. Now, was it a policy of extermination as an evidence that the British intentionally wanted to see Ireland fail and see Irish people die so that the population would go down and Ireland could possibly be civilised in inverted commas? It's hard to see if someone like Trevelyan intentionally did this, but if we read his own account of what went on, and this is a source that you can see um, in the, the Word document that comes after these questions. This is the final slide I'm going to focus on today. Um, in this um, source from Trevelyan, it's, it's a letter that he writes, and he writes it in October 1846, right? We're not even at the worst year of the famine yet, and he's writing this letter. And um, he writes it to his um, his friend, right, or Lord Mount Eagle, and it's his view on the the famine, right? And he says, you know, um, you know, obviously he's, he's very much aware of the the famine going on and the pressure maybe that it's kind of put on on Britain. Um, but he then goes through um, his thoughts on the famine, and he says some things which might not seem particularly um, nice and I'm particularly focusing on the final um, paragraph of this extract where um, he says I see a bright light so this is obviously um, after the second crop had failed right so this is still pre soup kitchens but we've seen the crop now down to 3 million and 3 million tons and people are now dying right and he says um, I see a bright light shining in the distance through the dark cloud which at present hangs over Ireland the deep and inveterate um, root of social evil remains and I hope I am not guilty of irreverence we possibly are in thinking that this being altogether beyond the power of man i.e. this is a kind of God given natural disaster the cure has been applied by the direct stroke of an all wise providence i.e. God in a manner as unexpected and unthought as it is likely to be effectual God grant that we might rightly perform our part and not turn into a curse what was intended as a blessing. So what he's saying is, you know, Ireland had its problems, population was large, Ireland had um, a kind of real need for a restructuring of her land and agriculture, and we didn't know quite how to do it, but here God has stepped in, and what he has done is he has, um, he has basically brought to the Irish people um, famine, pestilence, disease, and um, this will wipe away a, a chunk of the population. Um, mm. It doesn't state explicitly that he um, he is in favour of allowing Irish people to die, but really I don't know how else you can read um, that, that final line. Um, so, you know, he didn't want to um, really say that, that, that the government should intervene because this blessing that has been brought to the Irish people, the blessing of death, if government intervenes, that could be um, a curse. This is a religious providentialism um, that existed and it coincides with this real desire to follow this doctrine of laissez-faire um, economics. So make of that um, what you will. There are other sources that you can read um, that might support this idea and we'll come back to the view of who is to blame for the Irish famine when we look at the historiography at the end of the, the next lesson. Um, but. At the moment, right, that's all we're going to focus on in terms of the causes. There's my city activities you can do, there's a really good video that you're going to have to watch on this topic. And then when we start the next um, video, or the next um, YouTube lecture, um, we're going to look at, you know, we're carrying on the same story, but we're going to look at the aftermath of the famine in terms of how did Irish people themselves overcome it. Let's look at the agency of the Irish population. And the main way that they're going to overcome this is to leave Ireland. And that's going to be our next story. But for now, that is all. Thank you.